Julius is recording, um, and now I've got the pleasure of introducing Dee McGee. Um, Dee is passionate about helping others transform their lives through communication. She's a public relations and community engagement professional with over three decades of experience. Dee relies on her insight and her expertise to assist clients and employees with proving with improving both their presentation and leadership skills. Additionally, Dee is an experienced public speaker. Since 2004, she's served in various leadership roles with Toastmasters International. And in 2021, Dee was honored with the Distinguishing Toastmasters Award, which is her highest level of recognition. Dee enjoys participating in national adoptee support groups, and that's how she got connected here with us, um, as well as supporting others through their adoptee experiences. And with that, I will give you Dee. All right, thank you so much, Bessie. I'm so honored to be here tonight. And I have been coming to the support groups with Adoption Network of Cleveland over the past year or so. So it is my pleasure uh, to be here among fellow adoptees and supporters and all of those in the adoption triad. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit about why I chose to talk about this topic, better late than never finding ourselves while finding family. And it kind of goes back to my story. Um, and I won't go into a lot of details on my story, but just enough um, to kind of give you a glimpse. So I'm a late discovery adoptee and they're also called LDAs. That's an acronym for someone that found out later that they were adopted later in life. For me, it was at age 23. Um, for some people, it was even longer, like 40s, 50s, even 60s. And when I was in college, I remember taking a psychology 101 course. And if I don't remember anything else from that class, I remember the hierarchy of needs, Abraham Maslow. You can just put in the chat if you're familiar with Abraham Maslow. And if you're not, you know, I'll just tell you a little bit about him. He was an American psychologist. And he had this theory that um, every human being has five human needs. And I'll just talk about them briefly. And I, I think they really resonate a lot with us as adoptees, especially as we're going through life, you know, whether we knew we were adopted growing up or whether we didn't know. Um, there's a lot of um, things that really resonate when you think about the needs. So the first one is our physiological needs. You know, every human being um, needs to be breathing to make sure they have water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing and reproduction or you know, sexual needs. And you know, as adoptees, you know, we, we grow up um, being protected and provided for, you know, most of us, uh, you know, our parents, they raise us, they nurture us. And you know, to make sure that we, we're getting our physiological needs met. Um, and then the next need is, is our safety needs, making sure that we're secure, um, that we um, are healthy, that we have shelter and providing that emotional um, safety that we need. Sometimes we don't always get that. We might have to get it as emotional through others, other support outside of our parents or professionals. But um, those are very crucial needs, you know, having, having safety. And then the next one is love and belongingness. Friendships, intimate, uh, relationships, family, and just a sense of connection, whether you belong to an organization or a group of people or a church, um, you know, everyone needs that sense of connection to feel like they matter and that they belong to something bigger than themselves. And then the next one is um, esteem, you know, having a high self-esteem. And it seems like um, we tend to get that as we're going through our puberty and our teenage years, you know, working on self-confidence and um, making sure that we are being respected and respecting others. Um, and as we're going through our higher education and just out into the world, um, just making sure that we have a high sense of self-esteem. And then the next one is self-actualization. You know, I call that the be all you can be. You know, you reached your highest level, maybe in your career, in your life, and you're just trying to be the best you you can be as you show up for others and for yourself. So those are the five needs. And 
when I, like I said, I, when I took the psychology 101 course, you know, I thought, oh, this is going to be my life, this triangle, this pyramid, when I graduated from college, like, and then, you know, I, I graduated from college, and I'm 22, and then a year later, I find out that I'm adopted, and then I felt like I was this different person, you know, even though my name was the same, you know, I just, it just turned my world upside down, and and then my my adoptive mother had died the same year, um, a year after I graduated from college. I was 23, just trying to find myself in the world. And you know, I struggled with some of these needs, the safety needs, the, the love and belongingness, um, the esteem and the self-actualization. Even though my physiological needs were met, those other four, um, I struggled with, especially the sense of place and belongingness. And, and so as, as I did my search, um, you know, I, I had lost a mother and then gained a mother all within a year, lost an adoptive mother, gained a birth mother, and all these additional family members. And then I ended up um, finding um, my paternal side um, this last year, like through um, DNA testing. So I'm also part of the non-parent parental um, events, or they call it the uh, misattributed parentage. So a lot of change, you know, over the past decades, because it started in 1991, and here we are in 2023. Um, and so I say all that to say that, um, you know, these needs, they come and go, like they're not really in the order that they um, have to be, you know, you might be at a point where you need to get your safety needs met, and that's more of a priority than maybe, you know, your esteem or your self-actualization. So this, this doesn't necessarily have to be in that order. But I will say for me, you know, I, I went back and forth with a lot of them. So it was kind of like the grieving process. You know, if you ever know about the five stages of grief, like the denial, the anger, the bargaining, the depression, and the acceptance, you know, there's a lot of loss when you're dealing with um, family members that have passed or you're trying to get reunited with um, new family members. So there's a, it's a myriad of emotions uh, that you go through. And you know, also just the other items that I wanted to talk about was um, your medical history, you know, not knowing that all of your life and making sure that um, you get that information that you need because that's not normally part of your record when you do your search. And then um, just identity is, is huge um, for a lot of us. You know, our name, a lot of our names were changed um, at, uh, birth. I mean, some people did keep their birth names, but some adoptive parents changed our names. And, um, you know, we became this new human being. This new identity was created for us. Um, and it makes you just wonder, like, what's in a name? You know, like, where did your name come from? Um, and how do you show up in the world, you know, with this, with this identity? Um, and then just the other things were just making sure that we heal from a lot of the trauma that we've gone through as adoptees and making sure that we get the support we need. And these support groups I found were really helpful um, and hopefully they've been helpful to all of you all as well. But, so I, I just kind of want to open it up to hear um, if people have questions about these hierarchy of needs and also is there anything people want to share about their story and what resonates with them as far as the needs being met? I can't see the chat. Okay, this is Barb. Okay, Barb. So did you find that, okay, so before this, these events happened, you know, to you, um, compare that to afterwards, what happened or which part of the hierarchy of needs do you feel that impacted you the most? And, and why, when it came to this adoption situation? Okay, good question.
question, Barbara. Thank you so much for asking. <laughs> I would say my button was stuck on love and belonging. <laughs> Out of all the five, and that's the one in the middle, because it was after my, uh, especially after my adoptive mother died, I was really close with her. And, you know, I felt cheated because it was like I was the youngest of my adoptive siblings and they, they had gotten uh, married and had kids. And here I was, this young woman just coming out of college and um, starting my life. And she, you know, didn't get to see me. She got to see me graduate, but she never got to see me, you know, become the woman that I had become at 23 and even now, you know, at 54. Um, you know, all of her investment in me emotionally physically and um, so then I struggled with you know well who loves me now you know especially and then as for my father died he died when I was 32 my adopted father so I struggled with um, feeling like I was this orphan like all over again like after they died and um, you know you have to be careful because it's easy to attach to people you know that aren't your family and you know you have to um, manage boundaries and um, you know, trust was huge and just wanted where this, my sense of place was and the belongingness that was huge for me. Like, and, I, and when I look back, I, um, I was a joiner. Like I joined a lot of organizations. <laughs> I was um, on boards and I was in professional organizations. And I also did my um, high school reunion, like from, I chaired it from the 10 year, from 1996 to like, uh, 2016, you know, I was the chairperson. And when I look back, I said, maybe well, that was my longing to belong, like, you know, more like family, like to me, you know, and um, it just gave me that sense of place and to belong to something bigger than myself. So I hope that answers your question, Barbara. Thanks. Yeah, it does. Especially that orphan, you, when you did the comment on, on the orphan. I had no idea that that was the feeling that I was going to have as being, you know, well into adulthood. Like this is something that we ascribe to orphan Annie, right? You right. know, uh, I did not expect to feel that way. But as I started with the loss of the parents, that's uh, the adoptive parents at that, like that's where it started striking, getting close to home, you know. Right, yeah. Um, Dee, we have another question in chat. Um, the question is, are you finding uh, that sense of belonging fulfilled as you seek your birth family now? Um, what have you had to do to find um, fulfillment um, for that need and belonging outside of your birth family search? Yeah, I do. I definitely um, feel the belongingness more now. Um, because I, you know, I know both of my origins, or both the maternal and the paternal side, and it's filled a void. You know that not knowing is just um, there was just this vacant feeling, like this this void that needed to be filled. So it, it helps provide a lot of answers and closure, and um, you know sometimes you don't always get. Um, Get the happy ending but you get the facts as you always say Betsy <laughs> you get the facts so yeah so the other part of this question is what types of things outside of um, the birth family search have helped you to fulfill more of a sense of belonging you mentioned your high school class reunion oh yeah <laughs> um, are there other things that have helped in that area yeah so the support groups have helped um, you know, being in, in around people who who get me and um, who are um, part of my circle and um, who are empathetic and emotionally supportive, who appreciate you know the, the DNA discovery and the medical uh, information and. Um, Yeah, just making sure I have a good support system, I'll say, has, has been important to me. But sometimes it's biological family, sometimes it's not, you know, it's, it's someone that you're intimately close with or just um, have a good relationship with. 
and that you know they're not trying to judge you and they're just trying to um, be a support to you. Hope that answers Tasha. I know Tasha put that in the chat. See another question from Nancy. Um, so we have another um, question here in the chat. Um, did your parents have the information for you or did you need to search? Um, and uh, did you have their support when you were searching? And in your then there's a second part. In your experience, what do you think distinguishes a late discovery adoptee experience from adoptees who have always known that as part of their identity of being an adoptee? Um, how did finding the facts of your life change for you? So there's three different questions in there. All right, I'll, I'll break that down. Thank you, Nancy, for the for those questions. Um, I mean, I had to do a search. I went through the adoption agency where they, yeah. where they adopted me from. And that was where I got all of my information because the, the year that I found out I was adopted, I was 23 and um, my adoptive mother had died. So I didn't get a chance to talk with her about it. I found out through another sibling, um, adoptive sibling that I was adopted. And so she, you know, I had taken this secret to the grave with her, but my um, adoptive father was still living. And, you know, he said he knew I'd find out sooner or later. And, you know, they kept putting it off you know, telling me, and, and by that time, I had already started a search, and um, I found, you know, my birth mother through um, the adoption agency social worker that same year I lost my ad adoptive mother, and it, it happened pretty quick, like within a couple months, um, and there was no internet back then, so a lot of my birth mother's siblings were listed in the white pages, <laughs> so that was like our Google of the day, like, just find being able to find someone. And uh, so she was easy to find, even though she didn't live in the same area I did. And for the next question, um, oh, and I said, and did you have their support? Yeah, so my adopted father, I did have his support, um, very much so, he was supportive. And then the next one, the, what, think, what do I think distinguishes an LDA experience from adoptees have always known? I think for LDAs, we struggle with, um, you kind of feel like you've been like betrayed a little bit, like with this, the wool was pulled over your eyes, like, you know, how could you not know all these years and just that loss of um, time that has gone by, you know, that you could have been trying to get your biological history and you know, the person that you thought you were all this, all this time that you were connected to your to these parents that were adopted you, they weren't your biological parents, even though they may have loved you and provided and protected you. Um, you know, the identity you thought you were isn't the, the true identity from a medical and biological standpoint. So that, that's kind of earth shattering, like to find out all these years that you know, you're not who you thought you were. Dee, were you able to talk to your parents about that or your father? Yeah, my, yeah, I talked to my father. I mean, he just, he just said they, you know, they just kept putting it off, you know, like by not telling us. And then he knew I'd find out sooner or later. But, you know, when I look back, I doubt they hadn't planned on telling, telling me. I mean, my mother took it to the grave with her, you know, so they hadn't planned on telling it. And I, I think also during that time, I was born in 68, there wasn't a lot of support like counseling and um, post-adoption counseling. Like they left it up to them when to tell the child. There was no magical age that you need to have this conversation. You need to sit down with the child at a certain age. And I came in two and a half months. So, you know, I was in their life for a long time, you know, from the beginning almost. But he made it seem like there was never a good time to really tell me. So. Um, was there something they were particularly scared of what, that would happen? I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't know. It's because I'm not them. So I don't. I don't know what what they meant. Why? But I, I think sometimes the divided loyalty issue is real. Um, you know, when you tell them, they they think you might try to not be loyal to them and try to find your birth parents, and there could be some division there. And I think also. 
the adoptive parent, especially the adoptive mother, goes through her own trauma of not being able to have kids for those that, you know, I mean, she had a child years ago before me through another relationship, but she didn't have any biological children with my adoptive father. She wasn't able to have any. Um, and so I think the stigma of not being able to have any biological children just carries a heavy weight. And you want people to think that, you know, this is my child. Like, you know, I don't, I don't want people to know that she was adopted. I want people to know that this is my child, whether she's biological or not. All right, we have a couple other questions. I'm going to skip one and come back to it because the one I think um, segues into what you've been talking about. Um, did you have a lot of anger or negative feelings towards your adoptive family? Um, because when you found out that um, they had never told you about your adoption, and does anyone in your adoptive family treat you differently now that you know? Yeah, I mean, I was angry for a little bit, but then when you know, I look back over my life, and I had a really good life. I mean, my parents were like heavily invested in me emotionally, financially, spiritually. You know, they provided like good role models as far as having a good work ethic and um, making sure education was pushed and exposing me, you know, to different opportunities socially and supporting me, you know, along the way. So, I mean, I went through a little bit of anger, but it was short-lived, like, because I look back, I, I know I had a good, good life and I know they wanted the best for me and that I was um, loved unconditionally. Um, so again, I'll circle back to the previous question in a minute, but um, how have you not let this discovery define who you are? Um, how have you worked through the pain of that betrayal? Coming through these support groups, <laughs> um, this group and other groups as well, um, I've done some podcasts and they've just been like a healing bomb, like a, a healing journey over the past couple of years. Um, kind of nurturing that, what they call that, like the inner child and working on things um, that I had suppressed, like for years, like I just did, didn't think it would affect me, like professionally, personally. And, um, you know, it started really coming out more, it seems like over the past couple of years, especially during the pandemic, where I was at home um, and I felt like more isolated and more disconnected from family. I live by myself and it was a struggle, you know, not being able to connect with people during the pandemic. And I really started thinking about it more and more and that, um, you know, there was still some healing that needed to be done. Okay, so we've um, got somebody asking, um, what processes uh, have you experienced around understanding attachment injury um, caused by the primal wound or our primal wound and what course has your healing um, taken around that trauma? Yeah, I would say uh, you know, reading books. I do have the primal wound. Um, there's another book called Attached. And it's about attachment theory and you know, how you have to um, overcome you know, the, the anxious attachment and insecure attachment and you really want to be securely attached to others so you're not being needy or being too anxious when you're trying to build relationships with people um, because you have to really not cross boundaries or make sure you don't cross boundaries you know when you're building these relationships and people have to respect your boundaries as well i'm just doing a lot of reading about attachment as well Sometimes you can um, detach as well, not just attach to others, but you can detach if you feel like people aren't pouring into you because you don't want to be like a, a um, doormat. You know, you're constantly pouring into people and you're not getting anything back. You know, they're not really an active part in your life. Um, so you have to be mindful of that.
and no one in my family, I'm sorry that the last part of that message from Louise mm -hmm. has treated me differently. They're, they're still like, you're my cousin, you're my family. Like, you know, they, they still accepted me. Um, but they knew I needed to do this healing journey for myself and they respected that. Have you had family members share that they knew? They haven't come out and said it, but I think some of them did know, but I, I think they were like, unofficially sworn to secrecy <laughs> but no one's actually said anything now that both of my adoptive parents they, you know, they never actually came to me and said they knew but I think they did know so. we get calls sometimes on our helpline um, people or people have approached me sometimes at events um, asking uh, what to do if they're a family member that knows that someone in the family is adopted who's now like an older person and they they don't believe that that person knows and uh, it's a difficult position to be in yeah. for somebody you know being complicit in a secret even if it's not their direct secret right um we have another question um did you feel like you grieved the loss of time with your birth family that you described. Uh, what's your deepest regret over the res the revelation? Yes, I think I've re resolved everything, you know, with my birth family. I, the deepest regret is all the time that had gone by. Um, but, you know, I could have been bonding with a lot of family members that have that died, you know, like some of the biological family members on both sides, grandparents, um, some uncles, you know, that I really could have built a really good relationships with that I didn't get a chance to meet um, because so much time had went by. But, you know, I, I did get to learn about them, you know, by like reading their obituaries and hearing um, oral histories from other family members from, from biological sides both sides, maternal and paternal. So, you know, it's good to have that information, even though I didn't get a chance to meet them. At least I read their bios and got to learn who they were. So a question about when you were growing up, um, the person's asking, were you aware of the um, attachment impact growing up with maybe not understanding what it was, or was this a surprise um, to you when you found out? Like, I know I've spoken to some late discovery adoptees that um, express, like I knew something was going on, I didn't know what it was until I found out, and then the, the pieces fell into place. You know, others um, feel very surprised and didn't see it coming. Yeah, I mean, I, I had like a lot of questions. I was a curious kid, um, so I, would ask questions, but they always had answers, like my adoptive parents. So you're not going to have your parents investigate it. You know, when they tell you something, you just then you believe what they say. But um, but I was still curious. You know, even once I got to college, and then you know, even after college, like you know, there was still some lingering questions that I had that I just um, didn't feel like I had the answers to. Like inquiring minds still wanted to know. Like I still wanted to do more research. I, I like I like doing research and so I'm a, I'm a good sleuth. So I, I um, you know, I still felt like there was that gnawing feeling of not knowing if all the facts, there was some missing pieces and parts of the puzzle that still needed to be solved. That's all the questions we've had in chat. Um, oh, no, here, that was the Meredith's question. Was that, was that? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I skip one? Yeah. Feel free to go back. So how have you not let this discovery define who you are and work through the pain? Or maybe I did answer that. Or Meredith, let me know if I did. I thought I did. Just wanted to make sure I didn't miss anyone. Uh, so there's a, oh, a couple new ones at the end. Um, so has becoming aware of your adoption brought you automatically through the stages of coming out of the fog? Yes, I'm, I'm finally out of the fog. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
Do you want to share anything about that process? Well, I will say once I got all the facts, then it was like, okay, now I can I can see clearly now the rain is gone. <laughs> I can sing that song, you know, like the clarity was there. Like now, you know, everything makes sense now. Before it just there are things that just didn't make sense. But, and especially like, you know, I also mentioned in the in the write-up about photos, like um, you know, when I look back at some of my photos and things, you know, I wonder what well, happened. There were no infant pictures of me, you know, baby pictures like that I didn't think about growing up. Like if there were just my mother was always taking pictures of us, like put them in those big photo albums. And we had um holidays, you know, we always celebrated birthdays. And so there was pictures of around Christmas time and birthday pictures and Easter and wearing our outfits and and all those things that you always had captions on everything. And when I look back, you know, I just, you know, this was just her, I think this was her way of just wanting to make sure that we had good memories to look back on. So that actually leads into, there was a um, question here about resemblances between you and your birth family. What's it like having um, that now? And the, I would expand on that, um, did you notice before that you didn't have that, um, was that an issue for you that might have fallen into place of the revelation? Yeah, there's some resemblances. You know, I wouldn't say I'm twins with everyone, but you know, there's some um, facial features, um, certain characteristics I see now that makes more sense. Yeah, just to ex expand on that, hey, hey D, it's Sasha. Um, I've heard you share before in a previous session that, you know, something building on what you shared earlier that your parents always had a, a, a quick response on maybe right. why you have a different body type or where, why you were taller. And right. I was just wondering if it's been feel if it feels validating to see those resemblances now within your birth family and and how you've kind of come to terms with both the sense of validation and also maybe even the re-triggering of that sense of betrayal or that lack of trust and just how you've processed that. Yeah, it is more validating now. Um, I mean, I, I did struggle with um, a lot of physical characteristics growing up. Um, but like I said, I just never challenged them. Like I just accepted what they said. And, um, and I, you know, I was adopted from the same race parents. Um, so um, even my complexion, like I felt like I was a combination of both of my parents. Um, so, you know, when, when you're adopted through another race, it's obvious you know, that you were adopted, but when it's same race, um, you know, always, you're kind of looking to see who you look like, but you're not really like, it's not really um, something that, you're really gonna be like, well, I really don't look like them. I must be adopted. So, you know, I just, but I knew there was some physical characteristics because I was tall and, you know, I had other things that were different, but, you know, I just accepted it. I hope that answers Tasha's question. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so we have a question. Did anyone tell you the story? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure <laughs> fully what that's a reference to. <laughs> Sarah can expound on that, what she means exactly. But, and we can come back to it. I see Dama has a question. Okay, so we can see. Oh, Damon, you go ahead. Hey, hey. D, I appreciate you being here for everybody. I wanted to ask about whether your your birth family fully accepted you, and then if they didn't, how did you cope with the the times where they didn't? Yeah, yeah, they have accepted me, um, and when well, I mean, maybe not everyone, but most of them have. Um, and I will say, you know, for the ones that haven't, um, you know, I just learned that, you know, you have to accept people where they're at. 
because sometimes um, they're processing things differently um, when, when there's a new family member added to the equation. And um, not everybody's going to be where you're at, you know, emotionally. And you just have to accept people where they are and not take it personal. It's, it's easy to take it personal. Um, but, you know, make sure you get support and help with that. And know that you've done nothing wrong, you know, it's just be born. And um, you want, you know, love and belongingness and support and acceptance. So you might not always get it and you have to um, just accept that. So what, what practices have you used to be able to um, accept things like that? You know, like it can be deeply emotional. I would say, you know, getting to the support through the support groups, um, talking to other adoptees, you know, other people that have had loss or grief or, you know, have hard, hard people, you know, aren't accepting them, other family members, you know, and they don't have to be adopted either. You know, everybody deals with um, people that don't accept them or um, maybe estrangement or, just making sure that you get the support you need um, through like-minded individuals and people that are experts, you know, in the field, social workers, counselors, um, sometimes your, your religious or spiritual affiliation. Um, I know I've been doing a lot of mindfulness work, you know, meditation, and that's really been helping me over the past couple of years. I'm more spiritual than part of a religious organization now. So that's really um, been helping me. Uh, we have a question about DNA. Um, have you done uh, DNA testing? And if you did, um, what kind of impact um, did that have on you? And also um, in terms of discovering other potential relatives? Yeah, I did do DNA. And it had a big impact on me, you know, getting that information yeah. and, uh, you know, what it all means medically and just knowing that you're matched to someone is huge. And once you're matched, you know, then you have to decide, do I want to meet the people? Do I want to do a search? Do I want a reunion? And you got to prepare yourself, you know, emotionally for that because sometimes people want to meet you and sometimes they don't hello hi i'm late i want to oops hi i wanted to know um how did you find your birth parents i came in late i'm sorry well the, my birth mother i found through um the adoption agency the social worker um, did um, and then um, my birth father I found um, through DNA testing. Does that answer your question, Nikki? Yes. Okay. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. The, um, I like to ask this because now that you're on this side of discovery and everything, what are some things that you like looking back um, that you found to be some type of advice or insight that, you know, that you could give to either us within the constellation or those who are working with people that are from the constellation that could possibly help people going through the same thing? Yeah, I think it's important to instill um, these five needs, you know, that, you know, you have a right to be here as an adoptee. Um, you know, you have the right to be safe and to be loved, to belong, to connect with people, um, to, to be everything that you can be from a self-actualization standpoint. 
and, and make sure you get the, the support and the help that you need, whether it's through um, religion or spiritual or experts, um, social workers, counselors. I will say through all this experience that I've had, I've become a coach. Like I'm really into coaching now. Like, and I feel like where, where was coaching all of my life? Like, cause it really helps you move forward. A lot of times counseling, you know, takes you back to your childhood and why, why are you this way? And you always want to look at your childhood and that takes you in the past. And we all do need to go back to the past, but we don't need to stay in the past. We can reflect on the past, but we need to move forward. Sometimes we get stuck in this rut of past defines us and it's who we are and you know we're never going to change and it's like no you know you can evolve like and coaching helps you move forward it helps you change your mindset to know that there are possibilities out there that um, you can show up better and uh, live a fulfilling life as an adoptee and just as a human being overall. Oh, my mic drop on that. That's, you know, thank you for saying that because it's it's kind of painful like to look back on things in our childhood. And it seems to me that the people in this constellation that we have to look back, I don't know. I mean, maybe somebody could comment on this, but like more often than other people, because we have an unknown, you know, some things we don't know. And that impacts us in terms of the type of person we are trying to become. Like, and then even questioning whether we have a right to be our own selves, whatever that means. Right. So, yeah. Um, thanks for saying what you're saying. And um, man, I would love to know if anybody has any comment about that. Yeah. Do you see any comments on that? Alicia has her hand up. Oh, okay. Oh, um, absolutely. Um, in the, this is my fourth year of discovering that I was an LDA. You are absolutely looking back over your, the life that you lived. And now you're looking back at it through a whole new set of eyes. You're looking back at it as a, a dual personality, you know, the person that you might have been if you were living through that situation versus the person that you were raised to be. Um, I, I have all of my um, non-identifiable information. I still go back and just read that over and over and constantly because as we mature in this journey, you almost have to go back and say, now that I've healed that piece, I can go back and look at it differently. Um, so it's, it's all, it's like one step forward, two steps back, just to do it over again. Um, so, I, and I don't know if, if it is, you know, just, just us, right, yeah. um, but the more information that we have, the more, every time a, a new leaf pops up on my DNA, I have to go back and plug that person back into my history. So it, it's constantly looking back just to even move forward. Um, right, yeah, no, you're right, you're right, Alicia. And it's also just that tug of war of the nature versus the nurture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. as adoptees, all we know is the nurture and then late discovery adoptees, we learn about the nature later and, you know, even, of people who didn't know that who people who knew they were adopted they learned about the nature later too right. but it's even more so for us finding out much later that we didn't know we were adopted so it's it's, it's a it's a pro everything's a process like you know, it's a, doesn't have any linear fashion oh and i think the, and the later you find out the more you've got to go back and reprocess over again Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was, we've all found out at, at very different ages and stages, and then you have to go back and say, and look back at what was said and what was done and how it transpired in a whole new different light. And sometimes you're even reading, oh, 
that's what that expression was. That's what they really meant by that saying. Right. Um, you know, yeah. my mother always had a, my adopted mom always had a saying that says, I know you, I know you better than you know yourself. Yeah. That has a whole new meaning for me now. Right, exactly. <laughs> I, know. I know my mother used to say, there's things you'll never know. Yep. Uh, whole <laughs> <No>. new meaning. <laughs> I understand what that means now. <laughs> yeah. Never say never though. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, do you have a couple other questions that are in chat? Um, one is, um, did race or spirituality differences in relation to this discovery play into any factors um, with your identity shaping as you went through it? Uh, race or religion? What was the question? Uh, spirituality, yeah, or race. Uh, no, race, you know, wasn't an issue because I, I was adopted through a um, same race parents um, and spirituality you know I've, I've become more spiritual you know as a result of all this i was raised in a um, christian home um, the african and methodist episcopal church growing up um, and then later i went to a baptist church and then my mother had even practiced buddhism for a little bit and so i you know I learned about the buddhist culture and stuff and then i went to um like a multicultural, non-denominational church when I moved to the D.C. area. So, you know, I've, I've seen all different types of denominations and religions. But, you know, I've come to this place of just being more spiritual um, because I feel like how my life has unfolded. Uh, I mean, I know there's a higher power at work. And, I'm, and there's um, nothing but a God that's made all this happen for me. Like, I know there's some type of um, spiritual manifestation that got me to where I am today. Because it's, I can't explain any of it as far as how everything has just played out from birth up until now at age 54. Like, how things just kind of lined up and manifested and aligned spiritually. The person that asked that question shared um, that her birth father, she discovered was Jewish and that that was something that was new for her. Mm -hmm. It sounds like that expanded her horizons, her view of herself. Um, we have another person asking if you found um, that your sense of trust was um, triggered um, more than you knew before. Um, from people withholding that truth from you? And if so, how did you manage that? Yeah, trust was huge for me. I struggled with it. Um, it's much better now than it was before. But you know, you gotta make sure that you start with trusting yourself and making sure that you pray about the decisions that you make and um, ask God for clarity and discernment um, and ask curious questions, ask deep questions. Don't just settle for surface level answers. You know, really be, really explore um, when you're building relationships and trying to get to know people and, um, and you know, it, it affects you, like not just personally, but professionally. It spills over into all aspects of your life, and you know what you don't, what you don't want to do is let it just get a hold of you so much that you just don't trust anyone. You just, oh, we have to trust someone. We have to build that layer of trust because um, we just we just can't function without trusting people, and it's not healthy. Like, and, and you build trust by building relationships with people and getting to know them. And being vulnerable, you know, it's scary being vulnerable, sharing stories and talking about yourself, um, not knowing how the other person's going to accept it. And sometimes we want to feel validated so that we, we're accepted and belong. And so that um, takes a lot of faith, a lot of courage. And like everything else, it's a process.
I see Alicia has a question. Do you see that? Yeah. Um, how, how long from the day of discovery to the point that you feel like you've um, had, feel like you had put together the pieces um, enough that you were satisfied with your story? How long did that take? Well, I'm 54 now, I'll say 53 years. <laughs> 53 years. I think the um, person's asking from the date that you discovered, like, so if that shook your foundation, maybe how long did it take you to find um, equilibrium and satisfaction with um, that discovery? Yeah, I would say once I found out the last discovery, my paternal side, um, it took, a, I'll say, a, a year. Yeah, like just going through all four seasons and just um, processing everything that has happened. Being able, to talk hand up? It, being able to talk about it is key too. It's cathartic. Okay, it looks like Nikki has her hand up. Nikki, did you have a question? Uh, I did. I think she pretty much answered it for me because I was going to ask her, how did she go about looking for her parents, birth parents? Because I teeter totter. I want to know, but then I don't want to know. Then I do and I don't. So it's just kind of back and forth for me right now. So she pretty much answered that when, when she said, go and ask God and let him take the wheel mainly. So that's pretty much, I guess, he answered it for me. Um, so we just have a couple minutes left. So if anybody has any burning last questions, um, now is a good time for that. Um, I am um, putting a short survey in the chat if you'd like to give us some feedback about the program this evening. Um, but we do have. Time for one or two last questions. And Betsy, I can put um, some of my links to some of the podcasts I did and some of my stories, if that's okay, if people want to learn more. Sure. Okay. And I'll put the Maslow theory in there too, just in case people want to hear more about that. And, you know, related to their own lives too. So that, okay, that's the um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs that you put in. Mm -hmm. People are interested in more information on that. Um, Nikki, in answer to your question, um, we do have a search program at Adoption Network. We'd be happy to talk with you. Searching is a pretty individualized process. Um, so if you come to adoptionnetwork.org, um, you can give us a call or send us an email, and we'd be glad to talk if we get started. Um, so Dee is posting a couple of things in the chat with um, links to podcasts that she has done, if you'd like more. Yeah. Um, and in closing, um, just thank you to everybody for being here this evening. Um, Dee, thank you so much for volunteering your time to speak tonight and being so open with um, all the different questions that people had. I really appreciate that. Um, so yeah, kudos to you. I see people clapping. Um, and uh, to just also let people know that Adoption Network Cleveland is a membership-based organization. If you're interested in more information, you can visit our website, which is adoptionnetwork.org. You can um, take a look at all the different offerings. We I did put some links in the chat to some upcoming programs that we have. So we'd be happy to continue this discussion in our general discussion meetings or any of our other programs. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you, Dee. Thanks everyone for being here.